Welcome to CommercialDrones.fm, the podcast that explores the commercial drone industry, the people who power it, and the concepts that drive it. I'm your host, Ian Smith. Hey everyone, Ian here, coming from Drone World Expo in San Jose, California. And now I'm sitting with Colin Snow, who some of you might remember is the CEO and founder of Skylogic Research. He's also known as the Drone Analyst. And it's always a pleasure to have you on the show, Colin. I'm I'm saying this like you've been on multiple times, but this is the second time you've been on the show. And it's been 11 months since that last time. And that was episode number 25. And we're already up in probably when this airs, it'll probably be in the 60s of episodes. So thanks so much for uh, coming back and joining us. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. And I love listening to your to your podcast. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, it's come a long way since then. Um, lots more downloads and listeners, etc. So yeah, we're here uh, at Drone World Expo and Skylogic, your company, Skylogic Research, uh, just released a brand new report on the commercial drone industry. And it's titled the 2017 Drone Market Sector Report. So tell us a little about this, Colin. What are we looking at here? So this is the result of a three-month study we did looking at four parts of the drone industry. We looked at drone purchases. We looked at service providers. We looked at business users, those in industry who use drones, and then software services. So we were looking to figure out who's buying drones for what types of purposes, from which makers, at what prices. We wanted to know how large are the drone-based service providers and um, how and where are they positioning themselves and which target industries and are they making money and if if so, which ones are and which ones aren't. Uh, We wanted to know about business users and their drone-based projects and which industries have tractions and which ones are are sort of lagging. And then we wanted to know as much as we could from both service providers and the business users about their software use. And this is a pretty comprehensive report. Um, It's how many pages roughly? 88 pages, 40 figures and tables. Yeah, no, it's a big research report. This is the good stuff, guys. Okay. So, yeah, I, I completely, and I think the industry admires everything that you do with Skylogic and the time and effort you guys put into this. Um, I've talked to you previously. Actually, I think we, we talked about this in the last podcast, but just so the audience knows, like what kind of, so we're going to talk probably about a lot of figures and statistics that are coming from real people who took this, you know, real drone industry people, depending on the category that they fall under. But what is the like methodology, I guess, of, of the, um, respondents, like how many, how many responses sometimes? I mean, I, I know you're dealing with a lot of information here. Right. Yeah. That matters. Uh, so we, we, our online survey garnered about over 2,600 respondents, uh, in 60 industries worldwide. Uh, we had a 98.6% completion rate, uh, which is really good for a survey. So, um, Our confidence level is really high in the statistics, so we run a confidence level against any survey that we do, and this one's 99%, plus or minus 2.5%. So it's valid for a population of 15 million and over. Okay. Uh, so, nice. you know, it, it yielded, we, we have, we have this broken down and easy for people to understand. We, we just don't throw at people a bunch of statistics. The report has 10 key insights up front. So it reads like a pyramid. You know, we start at the top and we say, Hey, you know, in general, these are the 10 things we found, uh, that were most interesting and significant. And then we break it down by those four sectors. And then we give the detailed graphs and information for people who really want to drill into something specific. Cool. So I was actually a participant in this. And so the results, of course, are very interesting to me. And I'm I'm sure some of the people actually listening to this were also participants. Um, So let's let's kind of get into it. I mean, you know, uh, you just came off of your presentation here. I was in it and I got to catch about 15 minutes of it before I kind of came here to prepare. And (laughs) <laughs> My question I have written down here is, was there anything that's surprising from the research? And I think 
it of course you know there was very surprising statistics and maybe you can kind of like describe the so why why is some of this like why would we find this so surprising as an industry i mean you know why is why are we going to be like questioning like oh wow like really that's true yeah there were a lot of surprising and not so surprising um but so let's start with what wasn't surprising because i want to put a foundation for people dji really does have the largest market share of drone purchases worldwide. We calculate it to be 72% market share. Wow. In the US, about 63%. And the reason that's important is because I think people need to understand the extent to which they are embedded in so many industries and, it, and used for commercial purposes. This is the surprising thing. They're not a toy. People think of them as a toy manufacturer, but really not. Uh, they've matured their product line and they've been smart about the way they position and price them. Um, so that's probably not a surprise. Uh, I think probably what is a surprise maybe to some people who are newcomers, it wasn't to us, but it probably is for some people, is that uh, the vast majority of people who purchase drones, and these are drones above 250 grams, so most of them have cameras on them, the vast majority of them, 68%, was intended for some kind of professional use. Mm. So the user sold us, yes, we bought this drone to do professional work. For a commercial. So, and, and just to reiterate, everything about this commercial or this report is focused around kind of like the commercial part of drones. This yes, isn't is. about like the hobbyist. Do you do, you do hobbyist yeah. recreational type yeah, of work? Yeah, we have data in here from hobbyists. So okay. that's that we break that out and we show, you know, this is what hobbyists do and this is what professionals do. So, for example, um, you know, 59% of the use of all drones, no matter hobby or commercial, are used in the area of doing film, photo, and video. When you look at just the professional use of drones, that is those who are doing it for commercial photography, film, or commercial video, or commercial photography, it's 42%. Mm. Still the largest market. Now, that's not a surprise to us because that's the same data we've seen since 2014. We've done this that portion of the survey three times, 2014, 2016, and 2017. Going back uh, to the purchases of drones, so DJI's uh, market share, according to your research, is, I think you said, 72% yep. um, mm -hmm. globally uh, with all the respondents. Who was, do you, can you tell us who were like number two was just so we understand? I mean, I'm going to make a guess here without knowing and say Sensefly. It's unique. Unique. Okay. Unique was number, yeah, and then, then 3DR and then it goes down from there. Yeah. Do you remember from any past research, has that changed or it fluctuated? It changed a little a bit? bit because 3DR dropped down. That's right. Right. Um, and their price points went down as people, uh, as they began to push it out into the channel and began to tail off as, mm. you know, and now of course they sell it as a complete turnkey solution so um, you would only see it under the solution set not necessarily the drone because people aren't purchasing the drone by itself except in the big box retailers yeah okay. and at lower like i said at a lower price points cool and so so what were some of the other trends i mean there's a couple that i definitely want to touch on but uh, what are what are some of the other surprising things or just interesting tidbits that you came across in this research or that I, i'm sure you designed the survey in a way to uncover specific details of course yep. and so what were some of the other things that you could share uh from the report uh well so besides uh what i said about um you know the professional use of drones that 42 percent of the people who purchase commercial drones for uh, are doing it for film, photo, and video. 11% said they did it for surveying and mapping. Um, really? Yeah. Only 11%. Yeah. Um, and after that, asset inspection, uh, only 5%. So this is typical what we've seen in our survey. Anywhere from 5 to 7% actually do it for precision agriculture. So the, applying drones for use in agricultural so purposes. Yeah, so sm a relatively small portion of the market. And then, so the biggest one besides photo and video yes is surveying and mapping and surveying. gis oh wow so it drops all the way down to 10 percent yes for surveying. that's right oh right, wow okay right. and then inspection and monitoring about the same and Interesting. then five percent for inspection and then it goes after that it's very small percentages and uh people using it anything from environmental studies to research to um, it can it, it varies from there. And again, that's consistent with what we've seen. But the interesting find is, and this will bear it out in other parts of the survey, was the importance and the pivotal role that the 
e surveying, mapping, and GIS firms play within the industry. Given that most people buy drones for photography and video and filming, the next largest user, both on the service provider side and on the business user side, are the surveying and mapping and GIS firms, the engineering firms that provide GIS data to industry. They do the mapping, they mm -hmm. do the surveying, and they do it in various industries, right? They're the second largest user. And I said this very on. I said that, that uh, as I looked at the GIS market, as they looked at drones, and this was early in 2013, this was the ASPRS group, the American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, as those people woke up and said, maybe drones are a cool tool that we should look at. Let's look at them mm -hmm. and look at the ability of the accuracy of what they can do. They've aggressively uh, tested drones in various configurations for uses, and they have found that there's good uses for drones in some of the work that they get contracted to do. Um, and I don't think that people quite understand what a pivotal role that they play, because many of these large reports, and you know, I think I talked about this the last time I was on your show, how many large reports are out there that say, well, the you know, construction business is going to be $11.3 .3 billion. And, you know, there are all kinds of studies that say and try to put a market value around what drones can do. They may be, they're probably double counting. Uh, they're double counting because those firms already provide that service for that industry. So, yeah, an industry like that may be getting uh, the see. value out of the drone, but they're getting it from the intermediary who is the engineering or the, the, the GIS firm. Interesting. So you also talk about, um, what was it, the trough or the chasm or something? So this this was like a recurring theme. So. It, it, you 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 can tell us about that because I don't I don't remember the whole like this was like the underlying theme I kind of gathered was like you know we're still not crossing this yeah we've not crossed the chasm yet and that's as we look at the business users there's lots of issues around uh, business adoption and those can be in in regards to everything from regulation to the issues that we have uh, in a particular industry and the standards that they have to adopt to use drones for data collection, and that can be anything, say, for example, in energy, there's all kinds of safety requirements regarding the use of any aircraft or any device within the confines of a oil and gas production operation, right? So um, same thing for uh, other energy producers or uh, same thing for railroads or same thing for um, transmission um, there are standards regarding the operation of any kind of inspection service. And so you need to meet those requirements. So drones are rigorous, looked at rigorously. So we haven't crossed the chasm yet because in, people haven't just woke up and said, yeah, let's start using drones. Mm. Uh, they're going, no, we, well, let's look at it very hard and make sure that they meet and we can form a standard operating procedure and we'll try them in proof of concepts, and they are, and people have done that. They haven't even gone widespread and haven't gone widespread across their own companies. So at the drone shows, we, you know, I and, and you and, and everybody else goes to the sessions and we listen to people's use case and presentations and they talk about the one mine or the one uh, aggregate pit or the, the you know, stockpile that they are measuring and and you know they may be doing two three maybe four sites but they have a hundred worldwide uh so yeah. you know are they using them at every site no not, not yet. fully deployed yet. no not fully deployed yet for lots of different reasons it's not just because of uh you know they they may have proven the safety case uh they may have proven the operation case and have a standard operating procedure but they have to operate that drone in a different country now Mm. So now they're up against the regulations. So this is the others. These little hurdles that yeah. every industry has to go through before we see, you know, this widespread adoption. So we don't think we've crossed the chasm yet between the first adopters, right, and 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 industries worldwide integrating them into their operations whole scale wide wide you know ac broadly across their enterprise because yeah as you and and what you mentioned that i caught in the in the presentation that you're doing so you have this like jeopardy board and each industry 
it's it's hard to explain. You have to see it. I can't really describe it that well on just you know with audio. But you know, different categories and different 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 items in all these categories that each industry has to has to deal with. And like I don't know what one of those categories was like operational. And you gave the example of um like uh land access or something like yes, that for right. uh, sure yeah yeah land access so land access in agriculture is not an issue right yeah, <laughs> it's walk on landing, the farm, walk yeah. out the door <laughs> and, you, and you do the field you're a telecom uh provider and you need to do an inspection on your tower you've leased that land from someone you you have to get to the tower you have to get access to that tower so you have to get permission to be flying around and it may have a small fence around it. You can't take the drone off from inside the fence sometimes. So there's lots of lands. There's an example of where, yeah. you know, where people, where that industry says, gee, wouldn't it be great if we could just do beyond visual line of sight because we wouldn't have all these land issues, right? Mm. I've heard oil and gas, you know, at the, at the not in the Bakken, but up, you know, where uh, the oil sands are, there are large areas of property where it's more dangerous to drive to a particular location where they need to do an inspection. They I would love to have a drone be able to do beyond visual line of sight and go and go to that operation and repeat the same inspection that was done before right the same data capture um and it's more dangerous sometimes just driving there than it is actually doing the operation so every you know so you have to get in a truck and drive and it's a long distance to get there. So people think about drones and, oh, it's an automatic thing. And I just got to press the easy button and it'll fly and it'll, it'll capture the data. Because there's a lot of great data, automated data capture and mission planning software that's out there. It's really good. And it's far beyond what the capability of what most industries can actually consume with their own set of operations and limitations. So again, we look at that as part of the, we haven't crossed the chasm yet. So because of this, you would also mention, and it's, it, I just want to mention myself that it's, it's kind of funny how we talk about like my episodes. I already know this episode has a completely different vibe than a lot of other ones because we're actually talking about like data facts that, you know, are purposefully been asked in a, you know, a very specific way to get down to the bottom and the truth of a lot of the, like, I guess you could just say, media conjecture in some time, some ways. And, you know, so, so the episodes that we do, do have a different vibe, but, and I preface with one of that, uh, what I'm about to say, I'm prefacing with that because you mentioned also, and I'm going back to that jeopardy column of, you know, issues that every industry has to deal with in different ways, land management for agriculture, obviously, or land access being a lot easier than, you know, for example, cell tower, the, the growth rate is not going to be as hockey stick in your in your opinion and correct. from your research as what many may think. Yes, correct. We don't believe there's a hockey stick. We don't think we don't think beyond visual line of sight is this all of a sudden, you know, gonna unleash an unlimited amount of demand because we still haven't proven many industries and many companies still haven't uh, gone through all of the cases made around the security of the drone and security of the access of where the drone needs to go and, and provide a repeatable process in a secure environment and that the data is secure. So we don't, you know, beyond visual line of sight solves, you know, one uh, friction, one piece of friction in the adoption, but not all the others. Uh, so we don't see a hockey stick. We see a, a progression. We and and you know, I hope people don't go with a, a negative th thinking that the industry isn't growing. It is growing, uh, and that's one of the things that the research does show is that more consumer drones are being used today to do professional work than ever before. Uh, because, uh, and I'll give you an example. One of the things we found previously is that the sweet spot where most people buy drones is in the $1,000 to $2,000 uh, category. So it's in the area of where a Phantom 4 Pro would be, just to use a brand name. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, same thing for uh, Unique. Um, so uh, in that area, people are using them. 70% of the people, in fact, that buy in that price range are using it for professional purposes. Now, that's a big change mm. from what we saw last year. Last year, we saw 63% were using th the drones that they had purchased in that price range for professional purposes. It's mm -hmm. jumped 
to 70%. And what that what we've also found is that in the next category down, which is 500 to $1,000, there's a 50-50% use. It's astounding to think that 50% of the people who buy a drone that costs between $500 and $1,000 will actually use that for professional purposes. Now, that can be explained when you start looking at details around secondhand use of aircraft, mm -hmm. lowering the lowered prices now of some of the uh, some of the ex existing DJI drones, yeah. um, the lowering of the price of the 3DR drones. So as these things have hit either the secondary market or they are yesterday, yes, yesterday's technology. And you see the same thing in cameras. This, this is no different in cameras as people bring out new camera lines within their prosumer. Those lower priced ones are, it's like looking at, I, I, you know, just looking at the GoPro market. What do you think the market is now for GoPro 5 versus GoPro 6? Well, a lot of people who hung back to upgrade to the GoPro 5, who are professionals, mm -hmm. are going out and buying the used GoPro 5s, <laughs> right? The people who are, you know, people who are turning over their inventory on a one-year basis, they're selling off on eBay their uh, GoPro 5, and now they're getting the GoPro 6 because it has more features. This is the same thing we're seeing in the drone industry. So mm. the price point stays the same. But last year's model had the features of a, that a professional was using a year ago. Why not just buy the lower priced one because it's good enough for the work that I want to do? Mm. So what we're seeing is, again, and so this is what, what I was saying going back to, there's more consumer drones being used today for professional purposes than ever before. And that shows the growth of the industry, right? As people understand that the price points have come down, it's easier for me to see the drone itself as a consumable. And the software is cheaper, right? People are offering freemium yeah. as, they're, as they're marketing. Freemium being the way in which you price your features of a software usage where with if you use it for a certain amount of times, it's free. Mm -hmm. After a certain volume, it's no longer free, and you're up. You're in, you're you're paying for it. Okay. Well, if you're just starting out, you may start out with the free version of it. It's no different than the professional version. It's just you're using more of it, and you're going to pay more for it. So, um, you know, people are getting into the business that way. And now, a quick word from our sponsors. Commercial Drones FM is supported by Deveron UAS. Deveron UAS is building a standardized drone network for farmers all across North America, offering on-demand, near-real-time, field-level data when you want it. To learn more about how you can achieve scalable data collection in agriculture, visit DeveronUAS.com. That's DeveronUAS.com. Hey. Thanks for listening to Commercial Drones FM. I think it's about time I give away a drone. How about a DJI Spark? Well, sounds good to me. Want to win the brand new DJI Spark? Head over to commercialdrones.fm slash spark and enter the super easy giveaway contest and I'll pick the lucky winner on February 5th. Oh, and don't forget to thank one of the 100 plus Commercial Drones FM Patreon supporters, because with their incredibly selfless monthly donations, they are the ones making this drone giveaway possible. To see what you get for supporting this podcast and to also donate, go to patreon.com slash drones podcast. But don't forget to win the DJI Spark. You can quickly enter at commercialdrones.fm slash spark. Okay, back to the show. There's this statistic I want to see. I wonder maybe in a future, or if it, if it makes sense to see. I mean, I'm just curious, like the the rate at which people upgrade yeah. their hardware, their yes. drone hardware. Because right. the way I kind of look at it, and I feel like it's fairly standard. A lot of people are looking at it this way, or maybe that's just me thinking that they do. But I kind of look at it like a cell phone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the U.S., you know, because there are global listeners. In the U.S., the reason there's like these two two-year contracts from cell phone providers, and you have to get in a contract with your provider to get your phone at a cheaper price. And every two years, you'd kind of upgrade your phone. Mm -hmm. And then I think most people 
people in the U.S. just kind of got used to like, you know, technology and gadgets. Oh, okay, every two years, there's a pretty big jump in technology. I'll upgrade my phone. And so the, that's the reasoning for the two year thing. And then uh, from what I understand and, and what I'm looking at in the industry is like, yeah, every two years is like, honestly, if I'm doing professional services with a drone two years later, if you're going, if you're looking at Phantom 3 to Phantom 4 Pro, uh, you're definitely going to want to upgrade at yeah. some point. Like oh, yeah. that makes the, that two year hump is the biggest. So I'd be really interested to see how many are doing like every year or they just get every new drone and add it to their fleet and then eventually just kind of kick away the old ones or sell them yeah or. i would be too i would be there's an attrition too with drones uh, that have crashed or you know been you know going to the side of a of a, yeah, of a gravel true. pit Just and, get the and new so one. they're buying you know they're buying next year's model why not um you know because it's at the same price um and then there's the insurance that comes with it right you have an assured program now that allows you to to get a, a replacement so there's all of that that goes in there i'd love to see that data too but we think it's somewhere the professionals the people who are who have a drone fleet that is more than one we think they're buying at least every 18 months Mm, that makes sense and it's you know by default we just like pivoted over to talking about dji phantom i mean i pivoted talking about dji phantoms but they're the ones really that have been around for multiple years that you can see the progression of their product line right, right and how it's improving at such a fast clip so you also talked about, there's a really nice insight. It, I mean, it wasn't from your report, or maybe it was from your report, but just about night waivers and the FAA. I mean, tell us about this. This is really a, a kind of eye-opening and makes you kind of start questioning things. Yeah, we were asking companies, we were asking service providers, you know, what's preventing you from growing? What's what's the number one thing that you're seeing that this preventing you from growth and everybody almost uh, unanimously checked the box that said it's regulate it's it's the difficulty in getting waivers and uh, uh, airspace waivers for the operations that i need to do okay i look at the data and i go of looking at the faa's data and what so 97 percent 90 they say 90 percent, but that's 90 percent of the applications i'm looking at completions something like 97 percent of the completions is people who have been granted waivers or granted waivers for the night to, to be able to fly at night so the industry is hard working on beyond visual line of sight and, and drone identification. I'm going, wait a minute, why don't you just put out a rule for nighttime operations? You yeah, would FAA, solve a yeah. problem. Most people want most people want the nighttime Imagine waiver. Imagine how much time they would be able to save. And you were saying like they would be able to work on other things, yes. like maybe beyond visual line of sight, if they would just come out with a rule based on all this data you're saying they have, like right in front of them from all these waivers that they have approved. Why don't they just come up with a standardized uh, rules, basically, around night operations? Like, yes, you have to have the posi- lighted position lights visible from one to two miles away or something. Right. You, you have cannot to have this fly set it. of security and this, sense, this set of operational standards. Yeah, I mean, that could all be uh, done, I think, done by a rule. But I don't know. Why is it not being done? Yeah. I mean, it could be incrementally. Maybe they're gearing up for a big announcement. I mean, like, it's like, I'm, like, I'm thinking and pretending they're, no, the I think like they're a trying to company. figure out their funding for the next six months. It's yeah. like, okay, what are we going to do? We got six months of funding. Let's uh, figure out what we can do within that window. That's true. Well, that, that was, that was uh, eye opening, just seeing how many night waivers are being granted and that there's still no rule on that. Maybe we're being slightly impatient because we're so excited about the industry and all the, all the things that are coming around about. It. But I have to say, it is nice to see a bunch of night flights and waivers being approved, you know, on the positive side of things. Um, so, so there's that. And so the last kind of little insight I wanted to talk about was the ratio of in-house drone operation. So basically looking at the business user, the business who uses drones. And so you have some data that you've collected and analyzed about them using it was like the vast majority of them are doing in-house Correct. operations basically yep. and we're looking at the dichotomy between in-house operations for a business and a contracting like a drone service provider correct yeah yeah and there was an interesting find in the research is that what we find is that 67 percent of business users that is industry are uh, that acquire or 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 do their own acquisition using drones, use in-house employees versus outside contractors. So only 33% rely somewhat on service providers to some 
some extent. Only 10%, only 10% rely solely on outsourced to contractors. Wow. And we think there's a good reason for that. Again, it goes back to the industry examples where you need the industry expertise and understanding of the operations and, and requirements within a particular industry and just pick pick a couple, you know, oil and gas or um, uh, energy transmission utilities. Uh, there are specific requirements for them to operate within that industry they are not going to use now they may have started without outsourced contractors to create the proof of concept to show that there is value to then explain that value but as these companies now begin to stand up their own internal operator operations they are not using the outside contractors. Mm. They are using their own Part 107. So they're sending their employees out to get the Part 107 so that they can operate, right, versus hiring a contractor. If you looked at this and you, we have to make some, I won't say bold predictions. I mean, just in general, like, would you expect if we're looking at these numbers in, I'll say two years from now, because I don't think a ton will change in a year, but in two years from now, I mean, based off of the data that you're seeing, would you imagine that in-house operations continues to kind of become a bigger chunk of the pie? Or do you think that companies that solely rely on contractors could potentially grow for more than 10%. I, I don't think it'll grow more than 10%, but I actually don't think it'll change much. Mm. That's my hypothesis. I mean, we'll take the temperature again next year, yeah. right? And and look and see what, what it says and see if we find a different number. My expectation is, is that it would stay the same because many new, many businesses are still figuring out whether they want to do and use a drones as part of their data acquisition they're still trying to understand the value of it yet we inside the industry we think there's all kinds of value we think you know gosh we go to these drone shows and we see these presentations like oh everybody should be doing it you yeah. know outside the drone world people are still you know mm. wondering whether or not you know that drone that's being used by some company is gonna be looking in on my teenage daughter swimming in the pool in my backyard. They're still thinking that. Yeah. So there's privacy issues and risk issues. I've seen statistics in, from uh, risk managers. Those are the people within the company who are really, uh, I I who are tasked with uh, looking at risk, and that includes insurance risk within the company. Um, the insurance companies have pulled those people and said, you know, what's the number one issue that you see? Um, it's privacy. It's hmm. privacy and then it's data security. So privacy and data security are two part of the risks that are out. It's really sort of, you know, they're inside the drone sphere, but they're, you know, but they are bigger issues that companies are looking at and, and eyeball as they eyeball drones, they go, I'm not sure, you know, there's, there's a risk, there's privacy risk and we don't want to put our company at risk. Uh, big companies are not, you know, they're risk averse. What is the the model called with the trough of disillusionment? It's uh, I forget what the, the crossing the chasm was a yeah. So it, oh so 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 basically you're saying that, and I think I saw maybe a tweet from you or something. It was like the drone industry, like along the the, oh, um, the hype, hype cycle, yeah, yes. the hype cycle. That's the Gartner hype cycle. Gartner yes. hype cycle. So there's so the trough are, of disillusionment. Are we in? Is the yeah, drone industry in? Yeah, the definitely. Trough of I think they pegged it. Actually, I think uh, Gartner pegged it correct. We are sliding down what's called the trough of disillusionment, which means that the industry had peaked in hype, and we think it peaked in hype in 2016 too. Uh, that is, the assumption that drones could do everything. We had flying taxis. We had people show up at drone shows and everybody's ooh and ahing, and you know, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, flying this, Publicity and stunt. people are thinking that drones are going to be, you know, dropping, you know, burritos and, and and pizzas at my house. And how come we haven't seen that? That's, that you go to you get asked this question. You go to dinner party. You get asked, "What's the first question you get? When am I going to get be able to get you know drone delivery? Yeah. When am I going to be able to get you know pizza?" said, well, no, no, stick with DoorDash right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if they're still around yeah, in, a, right. if, in a year, I mean, it's looking. Yeah. Iffy. Yeah. So, it, you know, those are the things. But that's the hype. That was the hype. And so yeah. now people are coming to the realistic, uh, you know, expectation. This is why I have the Jeopardy board. Um, there's all these things that have to happen before we see any kind of steady, smooth adoption um, by industry and we're outside of the hype and people understand the business value and you and I, we think there's great business value in drones and, um, 
but all these other issues have to be addressed for yeah. companies to get to to a widespread and get us out of the trough of disillusionment. Well, that's exciting for me because there's always, you know, we've always talked about, oh yeah, is the drone industry overhyped? And it's like, you know, there's all these reports and everything. So I'm, I'm excited to know that we're in the trough of disillusionment because the only way from here is up <laughs> or maybe there's a little bit further we go down and we go back up again and then there's a plateau of productivity yes. but i i believe that as drones progress and 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 you you stop seeing you know we're looking at one facet of drones right now which is the way that they have cameras and things on them but i think once that drones start affecting the physical world and fixing things from the air and screwing in screws that they detected uh, that were loose or something or that they can fix something with a, an attached tool and then they start delivering things i think there could maybe be there's a you know another like hype cycle that that goes through the industry to where drones can start affecting our physical environment in, in as opposed to what we do now is mainly they're like observation tools that yeah. get in interesting uh, areas well, so one of the things i've heard from drone companies is in uh, i don't mean to sound uh, uh, uh in any way um in disregard for people who suffered the losses of the hurricanes and you know it was a tremendous amount of personal and property loss, mm. um, it was a boom for the industry mm -hmm. because what happened is all of a sudden the insurance companies, uh, uh, adjuster, adjustment companies woke up and said, we need it right now. We have areas that are flooded and we need to get these assessments done and we can't get our, our inspectors into the locations. And so would you ship us 10 drones tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Right. And that happened across the industry like that. Yeah. So there was a positive effect from these disasters that uh, people are now understanding, the businesses and people are understanding. And there was a lot of positive press that came up, came from it. So um, to dehype the industry is to provide the clear human uh, and and industrial and business value that drones provide versus delivering burritos and pizzas and flying taxis around to Dubai. I'm sorry. Just that's not business value to me. That's uh, that is where there was hype. And now there is some real story. So I, I'm hopeful that we'll get out of this trough of disillusion with more positive use cases like that. I hope it doesn't come as a result of disasters. Yeah. But I do hope that that from this, we'll see more positive press about drones as a result of that. On that note, we are going to go ahead and end the podcast. That was beautiful, by the way. So I, I completely agree. Uh, everyone that's listening, you can go ahead and follow Colin Snow on Twitter at Drone Analyst and visit the website DroneAnalyst.com to get the official 27 drone market sector report. And while you're at it, you can follow the podcast at Drones Podcast on Twitter and Facebook.com slash Drones Podcast. Um, Thank you so much for listening. And <laughs> Colin, uh, thank you so much for joining again on the podcast. I think we need to make this definitely a yearly or every 11 months kind of thing. That's that's what what, what the last uh, episode was. Um, so what? This will be in the episodes in the 60s. I guess I'll see you again in the 80s or so. <laughs> okay. That's great. We relive the 80s. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah. Thank you for having me on the show, Dean. Appreciate it very much. Yeah, yeah. My, my pleasure. So everyone, we're cutting off the mics. Fly safe. Cheers. Cheers.